அனுராதாங்க <laughs> I am pleased to welcome you all for the final day of 3 days international webinar series on emerging trends in energy and healthcare. I am very very happy to share that the program has attained grand success on the whole. Nearly 800 views for the first day webinar on early diagnosis and awareness on breast cancer presented by Dr. S Anbu from UK and around 650 views for the second day webinar on overview of perovskite solar cells presented by Dr. Vijay Shankar Asohan from Sweden. I thank the almighty God all the participants who actively participated Healthcare. our college management I'm very happy to share the our principal ma'am and all our supporters in and out the college for such a huge success with my immense pleasure and gratitude i welcome our management president haji engineer sk saeed ahmed engineer uh, secretary sk kuda mohammed treasurer haji jafar sadik sir for the third day of this international webinar series I extend my hearty welcome to the mainstay and pillar of our college all rounder amiable and adorable principal ma'am Dr K Rajab Fatima for today's event welcome ma'am I'm much indebted to the leading light of today's event my thickest friend my well wisher Dr Kalpana Sethu assistant professor department of electrical engineering national taipei university taiwan i on and uh, on behalf of anne hajra women's college Welcome Dr Kalpana for this international webinar. Welcome ma'am. I extend my earnest welcome to our vice principal Dr S Sabrin Muni, my colleagues and my backbone from my own department and other from other departments of Anne Hajra Women's College who have helped me in all possible ways to organize this webinar especially Mrs Mumtaj and Mrs Bhuma. Finally I extend my warm welcome to all the participants for this third day of international webinar series on emerging trends in energy and healthcare with this welcome note let me introduce the today's star resource person dr kalpana setu b ms phd i am much privileged to introduce my thickest friend to you when i asked her first she immediately accepted to be a speaker but unfortunately she lost her younger sister two weeks back even though she did not revert I am much obliged to her sincerity and friendship. She received BE in Electronics and Communication Engineering from Anna University India in 2005 and MS in Electrical Engineering from National Central University in the year 2012. She received her PhD in Electrical Engineering from National Central University Taiwan in 2016. After her PhD study, she continued as a postdoctoral researcher in the same laboratory before becoming an assistant professor. Her research focuses on the development of biosensor, biomedical engineering, microfabrication, impedance analysis, electrochemical techniques for industrial and medical applications. She has nearly 20 publications in reputed international journals. She has presented several papers in conference, conferences too. Due to her academic achievement, she was awarded the NCU scholarship for an excellent student from National Central University Taiwan in the year 2015. Also she won first prize in the 2016 PhD dissertation contest of Taiwanese Association for Consumer Electronic Society. She is also in the editorial board for some internal international journals. With this introduction I now hand over the session to our principal ma'am Dr. Rajab Fatima. Welcome. Her. Thank you. In the name of Allah the most gracious and most merciful I am privileged and honored to welcome dr kalpana setu assistant professor department of electrical engineering national taipei university taiwan to this webinar series on emerging trends in energy and healthcare 
organized by the Department of Chemistry to talk on biosensors for clinical application. Welcome, Madam. Uh, first, let me congratulate Dr. Anuradha, head of the Department of Chemistry, and all the other members of the Department of Chemistry for organizing these three days webinar program. In today's cutthroat competition, knowledge should be gathered from every nook and corner. That is how our college has arranged these types of webinars from national and international level. I, I, I would like to place on record my gratitude to the management committee members for being supportive to us in all our programs and activities. We have to pray to God Almighty for wisdom to plan how to best utilize the limited time on earth that, is, that, has, that he has gifted to us. My congratulations are also due to the staff of the Department of Computer Science, Mrs. Bhuma and Mrs. Mumtaj Begum, for their technical support extended to me in conducting all these webinars. Thank you. Over to Dr. Kalpana Sethu. Thank you, ma'am. And thank you, Anuradha, for introducing me. Yeah. And first, I would like to uh, express my sincere gratitude to Anne Hajira Women's College Management and Principal Ma'am, Dr. K. Rajab Fatima, and uh, HOD of Chemistry Department, Dr. Anuradha Ma'am, for organizing such a wonderful webinar. And it's a great honor for me to participate in this webinar. Okay. And let me start my presentation. Okay. Can you see my screen? Yes, can see your screen. Okay, okay, thank you. And my presentation is about biosensors for clinical applications. Yeah, and my name is Kalpana Setu. I do have a Chinese name called uh, Su Hongna. And uh, I'll introduce myself. Okay, first, like I did my 10th and 12th standard in the Gaumont Girls High Secondary School, Jinji, which is located in Tamil Nadu. And I did my BE in the Department of Electronics and Communication Engineering uh, in Escape Engineering College, Thiruvannamalai. And this is when I received my undergraduate degree from Professor Vishwanathan sir in 2005. Okay. And later I did my master's and PhD in National Central University, Taiwan. And here is my advisor, Professor Tsai. Okay. And currently I'm working as assistant professor in Department of Electrical Engineering, National Taipei University okay, in Taiwan. Okay. And this is uh, me with the undergraduate students and with my colleagues. Okay. Okay, let me start my presentation. It's the biosensors for clinical applications. So in this, I will briefly introduce about the biosensors and also I'll introduce some biosensor, what we are doing in our lab. And finally, I'll give some interesting phenomena about the biosensor and I will finish my presentation with that. Okay. And first, uh, let's see what's the biosensor. Okay. So we might have heard about the biosensor. So once we hear about the biosensor, always the thing come into our mind is the uh, glucose biosensor, okay. because that's the only used or the famously used biosensor. And here is the definition for a biosensor. So we say biosensor is an analytical device containing a bioreceptor, which can specifically interact with an analyte and produce physical, chemical, or electrical signals that can be measured. Okay. So here we say an analyte is a compound whose concentration has to be measured. So in this case, we say the analyte for example, we say glucose is one of the analyte or urea or some of the drugs or the pesticides. These are the stuffs or the compounds which we wanted to detect its concentration or the amount. Okay, so this we call this analyte. And the next one, the green color part, you can see this is called a bioreceptor. Okay, so the bioreceptor is kind of a, is a biological element which is specific for the analyte. So this bioreceptor can be like enzyme antibody or the nucleic acids or even whole cells can be used as the bioreceptor. And after the bioreceptor, you can see there is a transducer part. So this transducer will pick up the signal from this bioreceptor part and that will convert that to a response signal. So this is the whole block of the biosensor. Okay. And here we say father of a biosensor is Professor Clark. Okay. We might have heard about the Clark's electrode. 
Okay. And he developed the glucose biosensor, the first and the most widely used commercial biosensor. This has been invented by Professor Leland C. Clark in 1962. Okay. And here are the main components of a biosensor. So when we take a biosensor, so it has a two important components. We call it as one is the bioreceptor, and the next one is a transducer part, okay. So here there is a block diagram or here there are some pictures as you can see here, starting from the left, we said this all like analytes. This means these are all the compounds that we want to detect, okay, from any sample. So this can be of DNA or any kind of chemicals or pollutants. Okay. And here next to that, we have a receptor part. Okay. So if we take a biosensor, so it combines this bioreceptor and this transducer part. So this receptor will have a close contact with the transducer. So here the receptors can be like enzyme, DNA, RNA, or antibody. And this will have close contact with the transducer. As you can see, the transducer like showed like only two times here, like we have like electrodes or fiber optic cables we do we can also use as a transducer and after that we have an amplification here is like a signal processing and finally we have a display unit so these are all the main components of a biosensor okay so here we say biosensors are operated based on the principle of signal transduction means like the signal transduction means like one form of signal will be converted to another form of signal that is like a measurable signal. Okay, so here we use a bioreceptor. So as you can see the green part here is allowed to interact with a specific analyte. Okay, so here this is a, in an oval shape inside we have like many compounds of different shapes. So we say this is a sample. So in this sample, what we want to detect is the analyte. So this analyte can interact with this specific bioreceptor, or we can say this bioreceptor is specific only for this red color compound. Okay, so this can interact with the bioreceptor. And the next part we say the transducer. So what this transducer does is that it measures the interaction occurred with the analyte and the bioreceptor and gives some output signal that we say it's a measurable form or the measurable signal. And the intensity of this signal output or what we say the output from the transducer is always proportional to the concentration of the analyte. Okay. And this signal can be further processed or amplified and to see the output or processed by the electronic system. So this is the complete block of the biosensor. Okay. Okay. And when we take a biosensor, it should have some features or like characteristics. Okay, so some of the important characteristics the biosensor should possess or like a specificity. It means like it should be highly specific for the analyte. So this one we can say, if we have a sample and it has like different compounds or it may contain thousands and thousands of compounds, but among that we want to detect only one specific compound. So in that case, the biosensor should be specific to a particular analyte. Okay. or the biosensor should produce the signal. Okay, this should be proportional to the specific analyte or we can say just only one analyte. Okay, or I can say one good example is the glucose uh, biosensor or the glucose sensing device. What we use, okay, it has to detect only the glucose. Okay, though we have many compounds in our blood, it can detect only glucose from the blood sample. Okay. And the next is like, it should be always like stable. Okay. And the reaction or occurs or the interaction between the bio recognition element and the analyte should not be interrupted by any other changes like a pH, temperature or humidity or all this kind of factors should not affect the stability of the biosensor. So it should be highly stable. And the next one is the linear detection range. Okay, this we can say the response signal from the biosensor, what we get, either it can be of electrical signal or optical signal, whatever it is. 
the response should be always linear with the analyte concentrations. Okay. And also it should be highly sensitive, like high sensitivity. Okay. And also it should be biocompatible since we are working with the bio signal. So it should also be like biocompatible and user friendly it should be like very easy to use and should also be like very cheap. And also the size should be very small or we can say uh, portable okay. <clears throat> or handheld device we always prefer. And here are some of the classifications of the biosensor. Okay, so we can classify the biosensor based on the bioreceptor. Okay, so when we talk about the biosensor, the important parts in the biosensor, or we call it as the bioreceptor and the transducer. And this should be like, both should be in the close contact with each other. Or we can say the transducer surface has to contain the bioreceptor. So how can we introduce this bioreceptor to have a close contact with the transducer? As you can see here, the bioreceptor should have a close contact with the transducers. How can we do this? Okay. This one can be done by using a different techniques of immobilization. Okay, so here. So based on these three, we can classify the biosensor. So the first one, you know, based on the bioreceptor, we can also choose different types of bioreceptors, or we can say, which is specific to the analyte what we want to detect, okay? So based on a, a bioreceptor, okay, we can classify into two types. One is like a catalytic biosensors, and it's one is the affinity biosensors. So in case of the catalytic biosensors, what happens if we have a bioreceptor or if the analyte comes in contact with the bioreceptor, there'll be a chemical reaction takes place. And the, the detection signal is based on the chemical reaction occurs between the analyte and the bioreceptor. So here there is an example. The electrode here, what we call, this is a transducer. And the transducer surface here has been immobilized or it has close contact with the bioreceptor, we call it as GOX. Okay. glucose oxidase this is the enzyme and here the glucose is the analyte what we want to detect okay so if the glucose get, reacts with this bio recognition element we call it as the glucose oxidase enzyme if this combines with this it produces or it undergoes some chemical reaction and also it produces some electrons so this kind of reaction we call it as the catalytic reaction or biocatalytic reaction. And based on this, we say this kind of biosensor or catalytic biosensors. The next type we call it as the affinity biosensors. So in this case of biosensors, okay, the analyte molecules will bind with the receptor. So here we see the example is like antibody in this case, the red line, we can say this is a transducer surface and the antibody here is nothing but the bioreceptor part. Okay, and here we have an antigen. So this is nothing but the analyte what we want to detect. Okay, so once we introduce this antigen with this antibody that will bind with the antibody, you, know, you can see in the right hand side, the blue color, the diamond shapes, okay, is already binded with the antibody. So this kind of change, or we can say it's like a binding, okay, will occur in this type of biosensors. So this is called affinity. So we can simply say in the catalytic biosensors, chemical reaction will take place. And in the affinity biosensors, the binding of the analyte with the biorecognition element will take place. And the next one is about the immobilization method. So when we want to introduce this bioreceptors onto the transducer surface, we may have to adopt different types of immobilization methods. Okay. It's called like chemical or physical immobilization methods. So in the chemical immobilization method, we can have like two different types. One is like a covalent or cross-linking method. So in this case, the covalent bonding, okay, the second one. And the third one, we say is the cross-linking. So in these two cases, you can see, we make use of some chemical bondings okay, to absorb or to immobilize the bioreceptor onto the transducer surface, okay. And in the physical method, here we say just we use like adsorption. We do not use any kind of chemical bonding in this case. What we do the first time you can see is the adsorption. We just let the bioreceptor, okay, just put it on the 
transducer surface or we say this is adsorption. The next one is like entrapment. We do use some kind of gel to just entrap all the biomolecules or the bioreceptors and then just introduce onto the transducer surface or immobilize onto the transducer surface. So these are the four types of immobilization methods we always use to immobilize the bioreceptor onto the transducer surface. And then <clears throat> next one is the important part. We call it this the transducers. Okay. So here the transducer is the part okay, which converts one form of signal to the another part. Okay. So in this case, we can say we have different types, okay, like electrochemical. Okay, so in this case, what happens? Okay, if the analyte comes in contact with the bioreceptor, either the binding occurs or the chemical reaction occurs. Based on this, okay, we can see there'll be any change and we use some electrodes to measure this biological change. Okay, so when we use these electrodes, we can get the response signal as like change in voltage or current based on the reaction occurs between the analyte and the biorecognition element. So in this type of biosensor, we call this electrochemical biosensors. And also in some type of uh, reactions, you know, the temperature will also change. In this case, what we do, you know, as we all are aware of this one, if we see uh, two lines okay, in the strip, okay, then we say it is positive. If it is just only one strip, then we say negative. Okay? And the other two, like we say invalid. If no line, if we don't see anything, then we say it is like invalid. Okay, let's see how the pregnancy test works. Okay. So here, we, as we all know, the pregnancy test detect a HCG hormone, okay, which is a human chronic cordotrophin hormone. Okay. This will be produced when, <clears throat> when the person is like pregnant. Okay. And we can detect this HCG concentration semi-quantitatively in this kind of strips. It means like we can only know whether the HCG is present or not, but we cannot quantify the amount of HCG in these cases. Okay. So as you can see the test strip here, okay, which has like a sample pack, you okay, see? Here where we introduce the urine sample, they look like the first one here you can see. So urine applied to the sample pack. Okay, if a woman is pregnant, okay, urine contains the hormone HCG. Okay. So, and then if this goes through the further steps, you can see here, HCG will bind to the mobile antibodies in the second part of the strip, the pink color part, there, this part will contain the antibodies, okay? So what it does, the HCG in this urine sample will combine with this antibodies, okay? Or we say bind with this antibody. So HCG binds to mobile antibodies. And these antibodies also have an enzyme attached to them, the blue color part, okay? And then next one is like the test line. You can see there is a one line called this test line, okay? And immobilized antibodies in the test zone bind to the HCG, okay? So this test zone will be immobilized with the antibody that's looks like a light green color, you can see, okay? So once this antibodies, okay, with the HCG comes in contact with this test line, okay, that will combine with this antibody, okay? And then it forms like, okay, the enzyme on the first antibody changes the test line color. Once this happens, okay, then this, test line color will change, okay? And also this is for the control, okay? If there is no HCG, then this antibody with the enzyme, only this part, okay, without this HCG, the yellow circle, without that part, that will combine with this control line, okay? When this combines with the control line, this will also change the color. So obviously we can see two colors, okay, on the test strip. Okay, that's why we see if they are pregnant, then we can say we can have like a two lines. If not pregnant, we'll see only this line. It means like only the control line. In some cases, we don't see any of the line. It means like not pregnant. And also if we see like first line is like color changed or the first strip is visible, then it is also like a false detection. Okay, so we have to do the test again. So this is about the HCG test or the pregnancy test strip, how it works. Okay, this also we say it's a kind of biosensor, okay, but this is like a semi-quantitative. Okay. 
And the next one is the blood glucose meter okay, and the test strips. Okay, this one is a quantitative measurement. So in this case, what we get, the output is like a concentration of glucose in the blood. Okay, so you can see there's a glucose meter. Okay, this is a device what we use okay, to see the glucose. And here we do have a test strips. Okay. So what do we have to do is like, we have to insert these test strips into this device. And then later we have to prick our fingers and put the sample. We say here the sample is a blood. We have to put the blood samples onto the test strip. And then after a few seconds, we can see a display here. Okay, what's the amount of <coughs> glucose in our blood? Okay, this device has been widely used. Okay, because since we have uh, diabetes, okay, then we may have to have this device at home. Okay, so we have to test our glucose like every day or once in a week. Okay. And here, how, let's see how this blood glucose meter works, okay. So the glucose meter determines the concentration of glucose in blood, okay. And most of the glucose meters are based on the electrochemical technique. Means like the change in voltage or current will be detected and based on that, we can know the concentration of the glucose, okay. So they use electrochemical testing strips to perform the measurement. So this is one of the test strip used by the Freestyle company. They use this one. Okay. And when we talk about the electrochemical test or the electrochemical technique, okay, you can see here this part. And during the interaction between the bioreceptor and the analyte, okay, some chemical reaction will take place and that produces some electrons. Okay that will be sent to the electrodes, okay? So the final signal, what we get here, the signal is equal to the current, okay? Due to the electrons induced or produced during the reaction. Okay. So here in each test strip, okay, there is an enzyme called glucose oxidase. So we take here, this one as we call this the electrode or with this also we can say is a transducer part, okay? And in this case, this glucose oxidase, this part we call it as the bioreceptor part. Okay, so this is an enzyme. Okay. And this enzyme reacts with the glucose in the blood sample and creates an acid called gluconic acid. Okay, so when this glucose, this is the one what we want to detect from the blood. Okay, when this comes in contact with this enzyme glucose oxidase, it produces a gluconic acid. Okay. After that, the gluconic acid okay, then reacts with another chemical in the testing strip called the ferricin, and we also call this as a mediator. Okay. And here, once this has uh, react with the ferricinide, okay, then that will produce a ferrocyanide. Okay. And during this processes, okay, as you can see, that will okay, give some electrons, that will leave some electrons. So during this process, okay, electrons will be produced. Okay. So once ferrocyanide has been created, the device runs an electronic current through the blood sample on the strip. Okay. So we'll have a current flow in the electrode okay, due to these electrons. So this current is proportional to the glucose concentration, or we can simply say here, glucose undergoes and chemical reaction in the presence of enzyme and electrons are produced during the chemical reactions. As you can see, the electrons are produced. Okay. And these electrons are measured, okay, and this is proportional to the concentration of glucose in the sample. So the electrons produced okay, during the chemical reaction between the glucose and the glucose oxidase. And this can be converted to the electrode and converted to current in the electrode that we can measure. And the current induced, the amount of current induced or the amount of electron produced during the reaction is proportional to the amount of glucose present in the sample. Okay. Okay. <clears throat> and so this is about the glucose biosensors, the working principle, we said is electrochemical technique. Okay. And next I'll introduce about the, some of the research results, what we have done in our lab. So we also focus on electrochemical biosensors. And here the transducer, or we call it as the electrodes, we prepare by two different methods. Okay, one, we use the microfabricator sensors, or we say microfabrication technique, number one, and also we use the 
screen printer technique to prepare this kind of electrodes. So our work is, bas uh, is basically on designing the electrodes and then fabricating it and applying it in the clinical field. Okay. <clears throat> so the first one, we, if we, have, we have fabricated a sensor by using a microfabrication and that we had used to detect the E. coli in urine. Okay. So why we focus on this? Okay, so as we know about the urinary tract infection or we also call this UTI, okay. This presence of significant bacteria, so means like bacteria will present in urine, okay, that causes the urinary tract infection. And for this one, the bacteria called E. coli is responsible for up to 80% of the UTIs, okay. And the method what we are using to detect the E. coli, we have like two methods. One is the dipstick urine analysis, means like it's a rapid method, okay, we can detect immediately, but this is like semi-quantitative again. So here we can know only the bacteria is present in urine or not, but we may not know the concentration of the bacteria here. The next method, what we use, the widely used method in the hospital is like a culture method. So if we use a culture method, we may have to wait like for one to two days okay, to make sure the E. coli is present in urine or not. Okay. So here the detection limit, even we can measure or we can detect like a one colony forming unit of a bacteria in this case. Okay. So we wanted to develop an electrochemical impedance sensor okay, by using a microfabrication and what we do like equally culturing. And here the method, what we use is the impedance measurement. And also we quantify the E. coli in human urine. Okay. So the first one, how we fabricate the sensor here and the characterization. So here you can see the local part is the gold electrodes, what we have fabricated in our lab. It is also called as interdigitated microelectrode. And here we have we use the microfabrication technique, or we also use the photolithographic process to attain or to fabricate this electrode of this shape. Okay. And here you see the sizes of the electrodes, like electrode width and the spacing are like eight micro -end. Okay. And the electrode length is 500 micrometers. You can see the picture here, okay, the zoom picture of this electrode. Okay. And here, this one we call it as a chip. So each chip okay, contain like four units of the sensor. So here in one glass light, okay, we have like four electrodes okay, or four sensor units. Okay. And here, after once we fabricating the electrodes, what we've done is like, we have fixed a polystyrene chamber okay, covering the electrode part, the sensing part. Okay. And inside that, we have introduced the urine sample with or without the E. coli inoculations. And then we measured the impedance at different timings. Okay. And the impedance measurement was carried out from a frequency of 1 hertz to 1 megahertz with an amplitude of 100 milliohms. Okay. And this is the result what we measure the impedance as you can see is the impedance magnitude versus frequency. Okay, for the cells, what we have introduced in the chamber is about 10, seven into 10 power four cells per ml of E. coli in urine. Okay, so this is the concentration of E. coli what we have introduced in the urine samples. Okay, and let we let the bacteria to grow in the urine for 12 hours. Okay, and in between at specific times, we have taken or we have measured the impedance, like initial timing. Okay, as soon as we introduce the E. coli in the urine samples, we measured its impedance. We call it the zero hours. And then at specified time intervals, we measure the impedance, like one, three, five, seven, nine, and 12 hours. Okay. So here we can see at the low frequencies, okay, we could see a change in the, or there is some difference in the impedance signal. Okay, or we can say change in impedance was observed in the low frequency ranges from one hertz to 10 kilohertz. Okay. And we have plotted the impedance change. Okay, so here, just only with the urine, you know, even if, uh, the control sample, we call it as like urine without any bacterial cells here. As you can see, the impedance started to decrease, okay, when the time increases, okay. And in the other cases, you see initially the impedance reduce and then increase, okay, and for the high concentrations like 10 power 8 to 10 power 6, okay, the impedance increased from almost from the beginning, okay. 
So here we can say that we have expected that the control signal or for the urine, the impedance has to be like around the impedance change should be like zero here. But we found an interesting result is like you see the impedance is started to reduce in the urine samples, okay. This one is due to the chemical complex. You now there are many chemicals present in the urines, okay. So in this case, the for example, the widened urine composition could have reduced in glucose from glycolysis and decreased ketones from volatilization. So this shows that the chemical composition of the urine is like keeps on changing okay, uh, after the widened urine. So the impedance like reduced here. Okay. And for the low concentration of the E. coli, you can see this is reduced and then again increased. Then we found, we wanted to find out the reason for this. Then we found, you see here, we have taken for one concentration like 10, uh, 7 to 10 power 0. Okay, means like only 7 cells per ml we had okay, at the zero timings, zero hours. So here at 12 hours, you can see there are mainly E. coli cells okay, present on the electrode surface. Okay, because these E. coli cells can form like a biofilms when it is living in a uh, urine. Okay, so in this case, you see there are many, many cells. It okay, forms like a group, or this one we also call it as like a biofilms. If more biofilms are attached to the electrodes, then its impedance change, you see like this is like increasing, or we can say the resistance will increase, okay, when more of the biofilms are attached to the electrode surface. So that's the reason why we get like after a while. So during this time, okay, the impedance is decreasing is due to the chemical change in the urine. But after, the, after a while, maybe in this case, after five hours, it is again increasing. So this is due to the biofilm attachment onto the electrodes. This causes the impedance to change or impedance to increase, okay. And here are the calibration curve we have plotted with the change in impedance values at 10 Hertz okay, due to the E. coli growth and various growth times were plotted. Okay, so also we have found there is a linear relationship between the impedance change and the concentration. Okay. And we can use this calibration curve at different timings okay, to know the concentration of E. coli present in the urine. So this is of the one type of biosensor what we have developed. Okay. And the next one is like we also use a screen printing method. Okay. In this case, we have uh, developed a screen printer sensor to detect the microalbumin okay, in urea. Okay. So let's see about that. Okay. So next one is about we focus on this study because of uh, by considering the CKD. Okay. Once we call it as this is kidney disease. Okay. <clears throat> or the CK, the chronic kidney disease, okay. And in this case, you can see the healthy kidney, okay, the albumin will always present only in the blood. Okay, you see the albumin, the brown color part, okay, the brown color circles, okay. In a healthy kidney, if the kidney is damaged or it cannot filter very well, then what will happen? The, the albumin will be released to the urine. Okay, so the filtration in the kidney does not happen very well. Okay, so some of this album is a kind of protein. So this protein will be leaked to the urine if we have a, a damaged kidney or if we have any problem in the kidney. Okay, and here we have different diagnostic methods. Okay, like the urinary albumin creatinine ratio, UACR. Okay, and here the specimen collection is the types. One is like a spot, timed, or 24 hours. Okay, and how about the albumin range? Okay, in the urine, okay, how it should be? Should be always like less than 30. Okay, if it is a normal person, the concentration of albumin in, in urine. Okay, and the microalbumin reacts the beginning stage of the kidney kidney problem or the kidney damage. Okay, and this one we say is a chronic. Okay, this means we cannot uh, cure the kidney damage. Okay. So we have to detect the microalbumin in the early stage. Okay. So we say the microalbuminuria is a marker of early stage renal damage. Okay. If without early detection and treatment, microalbuminuria may progress to irreversible okay, my, macroalbuminuria over a period of years. Okay, means like it's irreversible, we cannot uh, 
cure the kidney very well. Okay. So here the test, what we use is like the spot test. Okay, we always wanted to get the result like rapid. So we use a spot uh, specimen collection and test the albumin okay, and urine. Okay, so in a normal person, it should be like less than 30 milligrams per liter. And in the microalbuminuria, we say this is the earlier stage or the beginning stage. Okay, this one, the concentration is like 30 to 300 milligrams per liter. And in the macroalbuminuria, this is a irreversible stage. In this case, the concentration will be greater than 300 milligrams per liter. Okay, there are many methods are available, but there are like requires long reaction time, special equipment or multi-processing steps, or even uh, need a professional staffs. Okay. And there are many biosensors has been reported already, but though they have like a high sensitivity, but the detection range cannot cover this microalbuminuria range. That is the 30 to 300 milligrams per liter. Okay. So in this case, uh, our motivation is like, we want to have a broad, detection range so that it can fully cover the microalbuminuria range. Okay. And so in this case, we wanted to detect a screen printed porous carbon electrode. Can okay. we modify that with the albumin antibody and then detect the electrochemical measurements and also detect the albumin in urine samples. Okay. So the first thing is like what we have done. We have print the screen printed the carbon paste. Okay. And we have also combined this one with the calcium carbonate and also the stearic acid. We have combined the carbon paste with the calcium car carbonate is due to, we wanted to make the electrosurface porous because we wanted to <clears throat> increase the detection range of the albumin. So this can be attained by making the uh, transducer surface or so-called the electrosurface porous. Okay, so for that, we have introduced the calcium carbonate powder and also we introduced the stearic acid because we also need a carboxyl group on the electrosurface for further immobilization of the bioreceptor. So we have combined all these three and then screen printed onto a polycarbonate substrate and then baked at 60 degrees C for 30 minutes. Okay. And then after printing and after baking, then we have immersed this one in a 1M HCL for one hour to dissolve the calcium carbonate. Okay, and then finally what we get here is like a carboxyl enriched, okay, porous screen printed carbon electrode, COOHP, SPCA. Okay, and this one, the XPS analysis shows that, you know, there is a, the carboxyl group present on the electrosurface. Okay, and then once we have the COOHP, SPCA, we have modified this one, okay, with the antibody, the HSA, okay. And then here the carboxylated carbon surface is being modified with the anti-HSA, the HSA antibody okay, by using the EDC images chemistry, okay. And we have developed the biosensor for albumin detection here, okay. And then also we have characterized, we wanted to make sure whether the antibody has been immobilized onto the electrosurface or not, okay, by taking the CM, the EDS spectra here. This shows like there is a, a element called N, the nitrogen element is present on the electrosurface. This confirms the antibody immo immobilization on the electrosurface, okay. And also we have characterized by measuring the cyclic voltammetry after the immobilization step, okay. So this is like a bear and after Introducing or after immobilizing the antibody, which is the antibody, you can see the current has been trapped. Okay, it's due to the uh, oxidation peak. You can see like the current has been reduced for, from A to C. Okay, this is due to the inert electron transfer blocking layer due to the antibody here. Okay, so the current has been reduced. Okay, and then this is the method what we use. Okay, we use the CA method this is also called as the chroma amperometry method. Okay, so in this case, we apply a constant potential and then we measure the current. So this is the potential what we apply and this is the current what we have measured for different concentrations of albumin in this case. Okay. <clears throat> so the linear part of the calibration curve here. Okay, so here you can see this is a linear range of our detection using our biosensor. So this part covers the microalbumin range from 30 to 300 okay, micrograms per milliliter. Okay. And also we have tested, we have 
uh, tested our sense about our uh, detection by using a screen printed electrodes. Okay, so I just show you only two methods, like one in a, using a bio, microfabrication method that has been employed to detect the bacteria in urine. The next method is like we use a screen printing method to prepare the electrodes and modify the electrodes with antibody. And we had used that to detect the albumin in urine. Okay, so from this one, we can say biosensor field is a multidisciplinary area of research that bridges the principles of like basic sciences like physics, chemistry, biology, okay, with fundamentals of micro nanotechnology, electronics, and also med medicine application. So this kind of, we can say it's a multidisciplinary area. So all the uh, scientists should be involved to develop a biosensor here. Okay. <clears throat> and the next interesting topic is about the variable biosensors. Okay, and currently we are also focusing on the variable biosensors okay, for healthcare monitoring. <clears throat> okay, so you can see here we can uh, have to say like a smart devices, right? So like glass by using by wearing uh, eyeglasses, we can also detect the concentration of lactate or glucose. Okay. Or by using a contact lens, smart contact lens, we can also detect the glucose. Like instead, of the method what we are using now to detect the glucose is like a invasive. Okay, like we need to prick our fingers and then it's kind of hurting. So now if we have a variable device, okay, even from the, uh, okay, like the sweat, okay, <clears throat> we can also detect the glucose. So here we can see like smart contact Less even from the tears, okay, we can also detect the concentration of glucose. So this is smart contact lens. So there are many like a variable biosensors okay, that can be used to detect any physiological compound. Okay. So for sure, the variable biosensors okay, are going to have a broad impact in our daily lives in the near future. And about the biosensor market. Okay. So in 2018, the market size was valued to be like 18.6 billion. Okay. And for sure, this is going to okay, like, uh, have a growth of about 8% okay, from 2019 to 2025. So we can say the biosensor market is going to boom okay, in the near future. And also it contains the variable biosensor market. Okay, this also will like increase by 9%. Okay. Also, this combines the non-variable biosensor. So if we take a biosensor like two times, can okay, be like variable and non-variable biosensors. Okay. So this is about the market analysis, okay, about the biosensors. Okay. So here are some of the references, okay, about our research work. Okay. And thank you very much for giving me this opportunity. Okay. If you have any questions or yeah, you can contact me. Yeah. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you for your excellent and interesting presentation. My pleasure. Uh, there are several questions from the audience. Okay. Singara uh, Vadivel, he has uh, two questions. How about the detection limit? Pardon me? For, how about the detection limit? Uh, he asked, how about the detection limit of uh, biosensors? Okay. The detection limit is the, you know, the lowest concentration that we can detect by using the biosensor. Okay. So it is also one of the characteristics, the important characteristics when we are talking about the biosensors. Okay. Mm -hmm. Means like, you know, if we have just a control, okay, we get some mm -hmm. output response. And if we add a small concentration of the analyte, okay, then we should see, uh, you know, the difference in the signal or we can say detectable amount of signal we should see. Okay. That one we say is the detection limit of the biosensor. So this is also one of the uh, important characteristics okay, when we design the biosensor. Yeah, it's about the detection limit. So in our case, 
in our albumin biosensor, the detection limit, what we get is about the 17 yeah, micrograms per okay, milliliter. Yeah. Though we say the range is like 30 to 300. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, ma'am. He has another question. How mm -hmm. about the electrochemical method? More advantage compared to that uh, fluorescent method? Okay. <clears throat> Hmm. Like for the fluorescent method, right? We need to have electrochemical. We can say it's a very simple, right? And also the instruments, what we need is like uh, not very bulky or very expensive. But when we are going for the fluorescent sensing, right? We need to, you know, like we have to tag the fluorescent with the bioreceptor, right? And also to Detect the fluorescence, you know, we also need some kind of instruments that may be like, hmm. or we can say the process may be a bit tedious in the fluorescence sensing, but electrochemical sensing is quite hmm, simple. Yeah. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, and uh, the next question is, what is the limit of uh, blood glucose level by Shijini? This question is asked by Shijini. Pardon me? What is the limit of blood glucose level? The level of blood glucose level. Okay. I we see. say, you know, like if we have a diabetes, right? Like the type one, though I'm not familiar with the diabetes, you know, the concentration and all, right? But you know, there are different types of, you know, diabetes like type one and type two, but we say the glucose concentration, right? Before meal and after meal. <laughs> Right, so there are many conditions. Like, if it is like above 120, you know, you might have heard, you know, from some of the diabetic patients, oh, my blood sugar level shoot up to 200. Right, so it depends, right, before you eat or before meal, after meal, right, or you know, if you take the glucose testing just in the morning, right, so before exercise, after exercise, there are many range, yeah, okay, so. We may have to check that. <laughs> okay, ma'am. Uh, Ram Kumar asked, uh, which materials are used for the electrodes? Which materials? Yeah, it's a good question, right? <clears throat> These days, you know, the usually the basic materials we call it is like biocompatible materials, right? Us uh, initially, they have used like a gold electrodes always, you know. And later, you know, since they found it's very expensive, later, you know, they also use the carbon materials, okay. And recently, you can see, like, the carbon-based materials, like uh, carbon nanotubes, okay. And uh, start the graphene, right? So there are, the, and also, like, crumpled graphene, right? So there are different or new materials are emerging. So still, all these materials can be used as the electrode, but... The only thing is like, we need to know how, you know, the, the conductivity is very important for these materials when we want to use it in electrochemical biosensors. So uh, conductivity and also like how compatible it is or we say biocompatibility. So based on this, we can use like uh, carbon-based materials or like the metals like silver or gold we can use. Yeah. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, next question is by Ms. Naushin Fatima. He, she asked whether biosensor technology will be most dominant in future. Oh, for sure, there's no doubt. Because, you know, like, uh, how to say that? For sure, the patients, right, are going to increase in the near future. Means like we are going to have many types of diseases. <laughs> Earlier, we didn't have many diseases, but now if you take the diabetes, right, you see the number of diabetic patients, how it is like increasing year by year, right? So we need a glucose biosensor. So similar to that, like cancer or many types of diseases are going to emerge okay, due to our food habit, right? So for sure, biosensor is going to be a hot topic in future. Please. Okay, ma'am. Dr. Postal, we asked, is there any method for diagnosing COVID-19 using biosensors? Yeah, <laughs> thank you very much. Right? We are also very curious <laughs> to develop a biosensor to detect COVID-19. Right? 
But since, you know, we are like, how to say, uh, we are a bit scared <laughs> to, to do any testing on the COVID-19, but if there is for sure, right, we can have a biosensor to detect like a PCR kit, what we have now, which is also a biosensor, right? We use that to detect the COVID-19, yeah. And in future, maybe we can also develop some kind of biosensor for the COVID-19. It's possible for sure. <laughs> yes. Thank you, ma'am. Dr. Samsia asked uh, if the chip can be reused, if can, how many times we can use, how to clean the chip? It's also a very good question, ma'am. The thing is like what we have developed. Okay, for example, if we use it for the blood test, right, or the urine test, if we want to reuse that, you know, the, the main thing is like the infection, right? So we always try to develop the, how to say, the disposable strips. Even you can see in the glucose the meter, we have a strips that is like a disposable or we can say just a single use because if we go for a cleaning, right? Then, you know, uh, we need to spend more time and also the materials we need, you know, that may be very expensive. We want to reuse the chip. Instead, we can develop a new one. So we always prefer like a single use because the only concern is about the infection because the biosensors where we use is like you know, real samples like blood or urine, right? So if you want to reuse, so for sure there is a possibility for infection. So we always focus like on the disposable, right? Or single use strips. Yeah. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, Suchitra asked, is the wearable calorie counters all also based on the principle of uh, biosensors? I mean the variable calorie counter. <laughs> yes, right. We say, or we, we simply say that, you know, the sensor means like something it can sense, right? Or it is related to the biological field, right? We say it's a biosensor, yeah. So we say it's also coming under the biosensor field, yeah. Thank you, ma'am. And there's one more question by mm -hmm. Maria Cabriel. Is that possible to monitor blood cortisol levels using biosensors? Monitor, right? Okay. Yes, it, it, it's possible. Yeah, because we need to integrate the, the sensor with some device, okay, so that uh, we can monitor any kind of, you know, the analyte level we can monitor. Yeah, it's possible. But we need to have a, we need to integrate the strip, okay, or the biosensor with the device, yeah, so that we can continuously monitor the concentration. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you for all your answers. Uh, I hand over this session to Ms. Chitra. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, ma'am. Ma'am? Yes, ma'am. Yes. Yeah, I can. Yes, Chitra, carry, carry on. Yes, ma'am. Yes. Good afternoon, everyone. Mm -hmm. I am Chitra, Assistant Professor of Chemistry, Anne Hajira Women's College, Malapalayam, Tirnalveli. It's my pleasure to propose a vote of thanks on these three days international webinar series on emerging trends in energy and healthcare. First of all, I extend my most sincere thanks to thanks to the Almighty God for making this even a great success. I would like to propose hearty vote of thanks to our renowned speaker, Dr. Kalpana Setu, Assistant Professor, Department of Electrical Engineering, National Taipei University, Taiwan, for gracing today's webinar. Thank you, ma'am, for making excellent presentation and making this webinar interesting and meaningful. Thank you so much, ma'am. I also thank other speaker of our webinar, Dr. S. Anbu, Molecular Imaging Researcher, University of Hull, United Kingdom, and Dr. Vijay Sankar Asohan, Microscopy Researcher, Chalmers University of Technology, Sweden, for sharing valuable time for us to grace our webinar series. It's my pleasure to extend my gratitude to the management of the college, 
President Sayyid Ahmed Sir, Secretary Gudam Ahmed Sir, and Treasurer Jawa Sadiq Sir for their support and guidance. I would like to express our gratitude to our respected principal ma'am, Dr. K. Raja Fatima, who constantly support and encourage us throughout the webinar. Thank you, ma'am. I, I would also like to thank our beloved head of the department, Dr. Anuradha, who is our moral support and taking efforts to make this webinar successful. Thank you, ma'am. I want to thank our vice principal, ma'am, Dr. Sabreen Munir, and HODs of all department and my own department staff members, Ms. Lisavi, Dr. Samsia, Ms. Sindhila, and the technical team from Computer Science Department, Ms. Bhuma and Ms. Mumdas for making this webinar successful. I also extend my sincere thank all faculty members of Anai Haji Raman's College. Finally, I thank all the people who have participated and making this event a great success with your contributions and support. Once again, thank you all. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Thank uh, you I, very much. I personally Hi. want to thank uh, Dr. Kalpana for spending her uh, valuable time. In spite of her loss of her uh, sister, I really congratulate her. It's an amazing and astonishing presentation, Kalpana. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And I thank all the audience for our uh, great support. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Kalpana. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you very much for giving me this wonderful opportunity. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Shall we end? Yeah, end. Okay. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you.